So I wanted to let folks know that, that are joining us for the first time, um, this is a Sunday we call You Make the Call Sunday. I call it that. Nobody else does, but I do. Um, and what this is, is um, every November, I, uh, we, we engage in a little democracy here in the congregation, and I offer the congregation a choice of four or five um, sermons that I've given in the past that they can either rehear or hear for the first time. Um, and there's a ballot that goes out and people vote on it. And so this sermon called Unbearable Still is, is the one that won this year um, by a landslide. So, um, <laughs> so this is where we go. So I have this vague memory about 20 years ago that my wife and I took one of those personality assessment tests, like as a couple, right? And I don't actually remember the test at all, or even if it was like kind of a semi-legitimate one, like had some basis of research behind it, or was just one of those more entertaining ones, um, like which Hogwarts house are you part of, right? <laughs> so anyway, but what I do remember, what I do remember of, of us taking this test is we were sharing our results with some of our coworkers who had taken the same test, and one of our coworkers, after looking at our results, said, you must live in a very quiet house. And of course, she wasn't talking about the physical house, but the household, the emotional and communicative relationship between my wife and I. And I think her comment was in particular contrast to her relationship to her then-husband. They lived in a loud, at least noisy, house. Still it was, and still is true, that our home is quiet. It's sort of embedded in the way we communicate with each other, to our children. It's, there's underlying quietness to it. And it's just kind of the way we're built. And I'm going to note here that there are a thousand, thousand different ways to be in relationship, and I don't claim that our quiet house is somehow better or worse in any way. It's just the way that works for us. Anyway, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this idea of the quietness of my house, of my life, particularly in the last year and a half or so. And I was trying to think of this exploration in the distinction between silence and quiet and stillness. And I find it really fascinating that much of our thinking, when we talk and write about stillness, if you really read it and think about it, most people are talking about quiet or silence. I get the connection, of course, but I think stillness and silence are not necessarily synonymous, perhaps just wrapped up in each other. Silence is the absence of sound, which never really happens. Even the universe has this sort of background hum that our astrophysicists can tune to, which I find really cool. <laughs> More earthly, when I sit in silence, I'm not sitting in the absence of sound, Rather, I'm practicing a listening more deeply to the sounds in and around me, right? But stillness is something else. It's, it's the absence of movement, which again, never really happens, right? Even as I sit at my most still, there is movement around me and there's movement within me, heartbeats and the rhythm of my lungs taking air and releasing it. My muscles twitch, my head nods. Just to say that neither silence nor stillness are ever really perfect. Of course, perfection should never really be the point. Still, I am oddly this year, <laughs> anticipating the snows of winter. 
despite all the adult inconveniences of a really big snowfall, I do hold this childlike awe of the falling snow. You know, big snowfalls invite us to slow down, to listen, to be still. And I hope most of you, all of you, I hope, have at one time or another experienced the truth of the sublime beauty of the falling snow, the walking across the muffled quiet of the whitened landscape. And friends, if you have not done that, if you have not had that experience, I invite you to do so at our next big snowfall. Walks in the snow are best done, in my opinion, at dawn or twilight. Even better in the dark. Find a path or a field or just a quiet part of your street. Bundle up, wear good boots, and then just walk slowly and intentionally through the snow. And with any luck, you'll find that sense of transcendence in that silence. I have found, oddly, a love of shoveling snow, particularly in the dark. Particularly in the dark because it's when the world's noise seems to be turned down. And all that I can hear is the scrape and hiss of shovel and throw. And I find this work is best, and there are a couple people helping, but also silently, <laughs> scrape and hiss and stillness. In the shoveling, I become aware of my presence in the world. I am also aware of the cold and the wet and the ache of my shoulder, the labor and the effort. And the stillness after the snowstorm is not only the peaceful pastoral. The stillness is also in the ache and in the work. And maybe it's in those moments, in those snowfalls, that I become really aware of the sense of the human condition that a writer named Zat Rana wrote about in an essay published on Medium a while back. Zat lamented, we live in a world where we are connected to everything but ourselves. We live in a world where we're connected to everything but ourselves. And as I remember those words, they feel very real and true and frightening. And perhaps this is why, as we move into these winter months, we preachers encourage you into practicing stillness, be that through silence or snowfall or perhaps just a good book. A w as a way of connecting you to yourself. As a way of uncovering that which is hidden in your being. As a way of unwrapping your authentic self. But here's the thing. Friends, right now, in this moment, I find my forays, forays into the stillness, the stillness I'm inviting you into, I find my own forays into that to be fraught, to be terribly fraught. And I'm guessing that might be true for many, many of you here today. These last 20 months or so have been hard which is a pretty banal way to say it. But I realize that amongst all the challenges of our time right now has been the sense that we've used up all the superlatives in our lamentations of this almost two-year disruption of our lives. 
So I'm just kind of stuck with hard. This time, these months have demanded so much more from us than in any of my lifetime. That these months have demanded so much more from me, of course, is kind of a marker of the privilege that stems from the luck of being born into a white and professional class household in this country in the last 50 years because I'm aware that there are millions of people in this country right now who have had harder years than 2020 and 2021. And certainly there are billions of people in this world who have had tougher years. So I just want to know, acknowledge that this has been hard for me and for many of you but there's always something <laughs> harder out there, and we know that. But my meditations right now, still, my meditations right now, when I'm consciously trying to cultivate stillness and silence in my life, are anything but still, anything but quiet. And I think somewhere that still, small voice in my soul that I try to connect to is so disquieted by the sorrow and pain that I have, that we have been living in. In other words, where in the past I've been able to sit in the stillness and find hope and peace and a kind of gentle groundedness in my heart. Today, I find that space unavailable to me. It's occupied. It's occupied by the things I cannot change. And, and I'm deeply irritated by my impotence. That space in my heart, that groundedness in my heart is occupied. It's occupied by the things that I might be able to change, that I could change, but no longer trust that doing so would make any difference. Or perhaps it's occupied by a doubt that I can even make the distinction between the two anymore. That space in my heart, in my soul, where I have almost always been able to rest is now this hotbed of lament, of loss, of irritation, of resignation. Still. Uh, friends, for those of you who have heard me preach before, you know I tend to preach from this personal story, and I do so for a couple of reasons. First, I believe that authentic religious life unfolds from our personal experience, our personal stories, so the best way I know to communicate religious ideas is through my experience of them, right? But secondly, and relatedly, I am a student of the Quaker educator Parker Palmer, and he reminds us that in the university, the universality of an idea comes not from broad abstraction, but from personal story. And I mention all of that here just because I don't want you to hear, I do not want you to hear my confession of my soul's lamentation as something you need to fix or save or set me straight. I got it. My intent here is to let you know that I don't have the stillness thing down pat. That to be honest, right now, it feels a little inauthentic for me to call you all into stillness. To seek its gifts and blessings. When I find my own inner life filled with such uncertainty, such loss, such Frustration. But I also know, because I have heard you speak of it, that I'm not alone in that disquiet. I'm not alone in trying to bear the unbearable. You are not alone in trying to bear the unbearable. And still, There are often deep spiritual truths built into some of our aphorisms and cliches. 
and the one that I ponder these days is probably from a medieval Sufi poet from Persia. Many of you know this. It's the phrase, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. This too shall pass is a reminder that we live in, in an ephemeral life and perhaps an ephemeral universe. And so if the moment, if this moment is particularly difficult, just wait. It'll change. Always does. Of course, just like you, I know this to be true from the experience of living in this world. Our sufferings do not last forever, and neither do our joys. And so here we are into this waiting for the change, waiting for this too shall pass. And we go into this spirit of the Christian season of Advent, a season of waiting and preparation. A season to return again and again to the dark nights and to sit in stillness with the heartache, with the losses, with our sorrows. It is a time, friends, for lingering in that unbearable stillness. So this is our task. As we wait for release, as we wait for this pandemic, these pandemics to end, as we yearn for hugs and the real life face to face smiles, as we wait for true racial justice and healing, as we wait for the healing that we all ache for, we are called to return again and again to the stillness, not silence, not quiet, but real stillness, where there's a space of listening to our lives. Friends, I cannot promise you that what you'll find there is peace. I'm not going to promise that in the stillness you will find, on long last, a sense of solace. I can't even promise that what you'll find in the stillness are answers. But what you and I will find is a kind of knowing, a kind of knowing, a deep sense of the condition of our soul in this time, in this moment, be it hopeful or lamenting, be it joyous or weeping, a deep sense of knowing without judgment, of knowing without judgment of who we are in this life authentic and true. And that is the power of this effort of practicing stillness in our lives, of practicing silence. Yes, these are the doorways through which we move to recognize, to know again, recognize ourselves. Reinhold Niebuhr is credited with, offering, uh, with authoring the serenity prayer, which you're probably familiar with. I imagine most of you have heard it one time or another, and I kind of referenced it a few minutes ago. The familiar version, of course, is this. God, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. I once heard a colleague, the Reverend Aaron Gingrich, offer a very powerful modification to that prayer where she breathed, God, grant me the serenity to accept the people I cannot change, the courage to change the person I can, and the wisdom to know it's me. In the silence, in the stillness of this time, my friends, may I, may we all find the wisdom to know that the only person
person we can change is ourself. And we can do so only when we are at last able to hold ourselves still, even in the unbearable stillness. Amen, my friends. And I love you. And may we live in blessing.